Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. We are located in beautiful Uptown Columbus on the corner of 11th and 1st. We would love for you to join us for worship or just stop by and say hello. At First Presbyterian Church, we welcome you with grace and gratitude for God's love. As those who are able to please stand, our first lesson is Psalm 29. And listen now to the Word of God. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of His name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire and the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in His temple all say, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as King forever. May the Lord give strength to His people, and may the Lord bless His people with peace. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I invite you to stand as we hear the Scripture. The re- second reading this morning is from Romans 8, verses 12 through 25. Let us listen that we may hear what the Lord is saying to us. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very Spirit bearing witness. When our spirit that we, with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. In fact, we suffer with Him so that we also may be glorified with Him. I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage and decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirits groan inwardly while we wait for adoption the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we, have been, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Have you ever noticed those large billboards that are along the road that tell you how much money you may win if you buy a lottery ticket? Come on, you've noticed them, right? 
And, and I will confess to you that every so often when I see that, maybe more than every so often, I will play this little game in my head. I call it the how would I spend that much money game. And I wonder. But I must confess, this is not a game that came to me because I've seen lottery billboards. It's a, ca a game that actually goes way back into my childhood. I recall growing up that from time to time someone would make an announcement around the family or in the community of so-and-so had received a large inheritance and there was all this speculation about how that was going to change them, how they would spend their money, where they would spend it, how they would use it. And I remember my father telling me that when he was in the army in World War II, stationed in, in England, there was a car company there named Alvis, which is my last name. Not Avis, not Elvis, but Alvis. And I didn't grow up with a lot of other Alvis cousins, and I wondered, maybe they are long-lost relations. And maybe we will receive a letter one day from an attorney in Great Britain informing us that we are the last descendants of some great wealthy British industrialist and that we have received a great inheritance. That letter never came. But that's really not the point. The point is you can play the game. What would I do? What would you do if, by chance, you received a great inheritance? The book of the Romans in the New Testament is a treasure trove of faith. It has been used throughout the history of the church. Augustine contemplated it. Martin Luther and John Calvin worked with it. Karl Barth in the 20th century has, has uh, turned to it. It's a treasure trove. And today we delve into a little bit of that. Paul writes that to this group of early disciples in, in, in the city of Rome, and he tells them that faith in Jesus Christ is in fact an inheritance. In the verses we read today, it says, we are made heirs with Christ. God chose the children of Israel to be the children of God. That's the story of the Old Testament. Yet it is possible to become a child of God through Jesus Christ, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, as verse 17 reads. The Christians in Rome were not born necessarily into being the children of God. They were adopted. That word is used. They were brought to the table, brought into the family by an affirmative act of God to share God's love and God's grace and God's mercy with them. Why would God do such a thing? In the days of Paul, there was a great division in the church over who could be a follower of Jesus or who could be a disciple of Jesus. Did you have to become a Jew first to become a disciple of Jesus? Paul argued that you did not. But the whole framework of the Messiah comes from the Hebrew Scriptures, comes from the Old Testament to know that some said you had to become a Jew, but Paul said, no, you don't. No, you don't. It was a family dispute that rattled through the ages. Twenty centuries ago, in the first years of the church, though followers of Jesus were a very small sect within the larger Jewish family, within a very cosmopolitan, polyglot religious options that were available in the around the Mediterranean Sea. But today, things are very different, and we may hear that differently. But one thing that hasn't changed over those 20 centuries is our belief 
as Christians, our belief as Presbyterians, our affirmation that God is in charge, that God is our creator, and that God set in, world, set in order the world that we live in, and that we can trust God in that way. God chooses to bring into the family through Jesus Christ those who might not otherwise have been there. God has adopted us. The practice of adoption that we are familiar with, that you may be familiar with, is to voluntarily take into your family someone who is not born into it. Today, most often that is a child, maybe a newborn, possibly a, an older child. The reasons usually involve, often involve, some sort of instability in the household of the child with the birth parents or the family that, from which they arrive. In my family, in my extended family, there have been several adoptions by a cousin and by my brother of other children. And so it is something that I have observed um, not intimately, but as I have worked with my relations, I have seen this at work in them. And when an adoption occurs, the adopted child becomes an heir of the family. The adopted child is given the full standing of any other child that is born into the family. To be adopted is to be made an heir. In the ancient world, adoption was often used by rulers to choose a successor. Julius Caesar, the first Roman emperor, chose Octavius as his son and heir, adopted him. Even though he had children, he adopted Octavius to be his heir. We know Octavius as Augustus. Augustus shows up in the Bible in Luke chapter 2 when he ordered the census, when that was ordered in that part of the world. So adoption is an ancient practice of making someone outside of your family part of your family. God adopted those who were not part of the Jewish community as children of God and made them heirs with Christ to be children of God. That is good news to us because we are born outside of that realm. We are included as God's children in the world. We are brought to the table that God prepares for us. We are brought to share the good news and the love and the mercy and the grace that God makes available through Jesus Christ. Without that adoption, we would not be gathered here to worship today. That is the doorway. That is the entryway. That is the way that we have come to this place. But what exactly do we gather for? And why do we gather? Do we gather to rule the world, as it were, to have other people listen to our opinions and follow what we say? Do we gather to lord our position over others? No. No, we do not do that. We do not come for self-aggrandizement. We simply come to be part of God's family, to be part of God's children, to share the good news. We are brought into this family. We have been brought here because the world is an unstable place. The families of the world are in conflict. We are adopted, just as adopted children come to their families because of instability in their surroundings. We come to God's family because of the instability in our surroundings as well. We are made heirs to be at the table, to share God's life, to share God's goodness, not only for ourselves, but to share it, to take it out into the world and to live with it. Childbirth is oftentimes 
used as a metaphor for new life and for new birth. And it is in Paul's letter to the Romans as well. It's also used commonly in, in, in our culture. You may be familiar with a TV series called Breaking Bad. It was a, a sequence that uh, had quite a following among certain elements. It tells the story of Walter White. And Walter White was known as an upstanding chemistry teacher in high school, but he developed cancer. And he did not have the financial resources to pay for his treatment, and so he hit upon a scheme whereby he would make crystal meth and he would become a drug dealer. And the story is kind of bizarre. You probably have picked up on it. One of those guilty pleasures we might think of. But the story was bizarre. And in one episode of it, Walter White uh, it needs to be at the birth of his child. His wife, Skylar, is expecting. And she is so focused on giving birth. Yet Walter is thinking about another kind of delivery that he has to make. He is focused on something else, and it takes him away from what he is doing. I have to think that sometimes we are more like Walter White than we want to admit. I hope and pray we are not involved in illegal drug deals, but we can focus our attention on other things that draw us away from the delivery of God's love and life and joy and grace and mercy in the world. We can become fixated on our own satisfaction or finding comfort in the world or making our way in the world so that we don't have to worry about any of the details. We can become so focused about what we think of as right that we pass over and pass by other situations. That is a challenge. But Paul says the time of childbirth is an opportunity for us to think about hope, not to think about what we can get out of life, but to think about the hope that will draw us and fill us and, and sustain us in life. That hope is spoken of in Romans 8, the 22nd through 25th verse that I read earlier. It says, we know the whole creation must be groaning in labor pains until now. Eugene Peterson, a Presbyterian minister who translated the Bible into the, the message version, puts it this way, all around us we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning to, for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we become, and the more joyful our expectancy. The longer we wait, the larger we become, the greater the possibility of hope, and the more expectance and the more joyful our expectancy. Let us not miss the point. Let us hold on to the joy and the possibility of that hope. So two points will summarize our time today. First, we are brought into God's family not because of what we do. We are brought into God's family because God has adopted us. God has made available to us through Jesus Christ this possibility of adoption. 
And second, as Presbyterian minister Joe Evans has put it, creation labors as the promise of the kingdom of God comes closer with every contraction. Let me read that again. Creation labors as the promise of the kingdom of God comes closer with every contraction. That is, the world is working out there, seeking to give birth to something. And the hope that God has given us in Jesus Christ is that hope to which we seek and claim and attain. And every moment, every contraction brings us closer into that fulfillment. May we live in the hope that is provided by being adopted through the table God has set before us through Jesus Christ. So, the next time you see one of those billboards that notices the winning jackpots and mega millions and Powerball, the next time you see that, remember, remember that you have been made an heir of hope by the action of God in Jesus Christ. That is an inheritance that is not just to come. It is a fortune for this moment as well. As we worship this time, let us remember and lift forward not only that hope, but also that story, that story of goodness and faith that we may live in it in the world. In just a minute, we're going to sing an old gospel song. I love to tell the story. And it talks about people who long to hear the story and people who don't know the story. But the third verse also talks about the people who have always known the story and how we are still hungering and thirsting to know that story just like everyone else. This story of faith, this story of hope, this story of God's love and God's willingness to open God's own being to us and that we may share that with others, that story is the one that we have inherited. It is our fortune and it is our wonder and duty to be able to share that in the world around us. Thanks be to God. Amen.